You remember last time we were talking about whether or not uh, Starbucks coffee drinks were, on average, had more calories if they were ordered when you didn't have information about the calorie content on the menu versus when you did. So what I'd like to talk about now is what happens then if we decide to do a one-tailed test and put our whole 5% in one end of our distribution versus a two-tailed test. And we just finished completing that two-tailed test where we divided our type 1 error rate, alpha, also known as our p-value, 0 0.05, into 2.5% for each tail. So we were asking, does knowing the calorie content of a coffee drink change behavior? So we're looking at something like a skinny latte versus a frappuccino. And what we found was that significantly fewer calories are consumed when calories are posted on the menu at Starbucks, so the mean was 232, than when the calorie counts were not posted, where the population mean was 247 when they didn't post the calorie count information. And if you notice right here, we have our significant z-test of negative 2.36, and our p is less than 0.05, and that's a two-tailed test. So what changes with a one-tailed test? Well, we don't need to go back and revisit every single step of hypothesis testing, but we do know that there are certain steps we need to go back to and change. So the first step that we would change is the way that we state our null and research hypotheses. So how are they different? Well, with the one-tailed test, well, with the two-tailed test, what we saw was that the calorie content of drinks are the same when calorie information is on the menu than when it is not for the null hypothesis, and that they're different when there is calorie content on the, on the menu. However, for the one-tailed test, now what we're looking at is, for the null hypothesis, is the calorie content of the drinks are higher or the same when calorie information is not on the menu, is on the menu than when it's not. However, for the research hypothesis, right, the interesting one, the one that makes the prediction we expect to find, here we say the calorie content of drinks are lower when calorie information is on the menu versus when it's not. So, this is the main difference that we see, right? That we say it's higher or the same for the null hypothesis, and it's lower for the research hypothesis compared to the same for the null hypothesis in a two-tailed test, and different for the, null, for the research hypothesis in a two-tailed test. So those are the changes that we see in step two. Now, here we've state, restated um, these different hypotheses in symbolic form. So the next place we have to go, because remember step three was just about what are the characteristics of the comparison distribution, and that does not change when we change the nature of our hypothesis test from a, a two-tailed test to a one-tailed test. And the two-tailed test and the one-tailed test, both of them have the same p-value, the same type one error rate in this example. We're still setting it as alpha equals 0.05, or 5% of the time we're okay with making a type 1 error. But you'll notice that our hypotheses are different, and that our research hypothesis is that for our sample of drinks after the intervention of putting menu information, um, or calorie content information on the menu, we see that that mean is lower. Whereas over here for the two-tailed tip test, it just shows that they're not equivalent, that they're different in some way. So how do we do this? Well, with the one-tailed test, we put the entire 5% type 1 error rate, or alpha, in a single tail of the distribution. Remember last time, what we did was we took the 5% type 1 error rate and divided it evenly between the two tails of the distribution. So each tail has 2.5% of the scores. So let me show you what I mean by sketching out this, the scores. Oops. Um, OK, so we're determining these critical values, the cutoffs. So here we go. We've got our um, two-tailed test over here. And you can see that we've marked our cutoff point 
that we got from the Z table in the back of our textbook that puts 2.5% over here and 2.5% over here. Whereas we put the whole 5% just in the lower end, because remember, what we're saying is that we believe in the one tailed test that knowing calorie content of those drinks is going to reduce the number of calories that people order. So we still have that same type 1 error rate in both distributions, but entire 5% is over here, and then we have 2.5% in each of the tails for the two-tailed test. So if we were going to look up the value in which there is 5% in the tail, we have negative 1.65 as that corresponding z-score. So step four changes because it shifts our critical value back towards the mean, but it only helps us if we choose the appropriate or the correct direction of the effect. This is why it's a directional effect. We said it's going to be lower, so we need to have our score fall significantly lower than the distribution mean. So let's find out whether or not that's the case. So we know that what changes with that one tail test is, is step two, step four, and now we're talking about the decision. Now, it may or may not change. We might find that there's not a difference, that we still fail to reject the null hypothesis or we still fail or, or still reject the null hypothesis, um, theoretically, depending upon what our question was and what our critical Z value was um, and our computed Z value. So it may or may not change, but we still need to check it. So that's what we're going to go about doing. Now remember, we have our distribution. Here I've marked off our critical value and shaded in the tail that encompasses that 5% of the scores. And here I've put in our z-score that we computed in um, the previous example, which is a negative 2.36. And you see that we continue out here, and that's probably about where it is, right there. Negative 2.36. And that calculated Z falls beyond the cutoffs for, um, or actually the single cutoff for this hypothesis test. So we still end up making the same decision. Now, which is rejecting the null hypothesis. Now here the question is, well, is it easier to reject the null hypothesis with the one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? And you can tell, comparatively speaking, if we guess the right direction, this cutoff for the two-tailed test is negative 1.96. So it's nearly, just about, two standard deviations below the mean. However, if we look at the one-tailed test, it is not as far away from the mean as the cutoff for the two-tailed two test. So that one-tailed test, it's actually easier to reject the null hypothesis if you choose the correct direction. So it's easier to reject the null hypothesis if we know that our sample mean is going to be significantly lower or lower than the population mean. But if we don't know the direction or we guess wrong, then we can't actually say anything. What if we were actually above the mean? What if we actually increased by 6% and so decreased by 6% the number of calories consumed? Then we couldn't say anything about a significant result with the result with the one-tailed test. However, we could still say something. We could say there's a significant difference. It turns out people, they know the calorie content and they decide to splurge. And so, therefore, um, we could uh, reject the null hypothesis in this direction. But you don't get that advantage. So it's a trade-off. So you either can have it a little bit easier to reject that null hypothesis if you guess in the right direction. However, if you don't, then you still get that kind of um, uh, advantage of being able to still reject a hypothesis if the difference is big enough. So those are the changes that we see when we talk about differences between the one-tailed test and the two-tailed test for a one-sample z-test.